Here are a few rappers who love doing crime. Number 8. Spot'em Got'em Rapper Spot'em Got'em released a viral song in 2020 called Beatbox. The song caught plenty of people's attention and gained some new listeners. In early June 2020, Spot'em found himself in a car full of friends. They must have been having a party because when they saw a gate blocking their way, they just ran it over. This gate blocked the entrance to a parking garage that the group was trying to get into. When someone approached the group about what they had just done, Spot'em pulled out a semi-automatic weapon. He and his friends fled the scene after the incident, and nothing seemed to come of it at first. The young rapper felt like he'd gotten away with everything. He still seemed real comfortable when the cops found him on July 15th, asleep in his bed with a Draco, an AK-47 pistol that he wasn't supposed to have. They arrested him with the help of a warrant that was issued after the parking garage incident. Spot'em was charged with multiple crimes, including aggravated assault with a firearm, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, an accessory after the fact to a felony. After reviewing the case, a judge set his bond at a little over $18,000. Number 7. Pop Out Boys The amateur rap group Pop Out Boys tried to make it big and live the infamous lifestyle of the rappers they idolized. However, they felt like no one would take them seriously unless they could flash the cash like everyone else. The boys came up with a credit card scam to get rich quickly and remedy this issue. They started buying stolen identities off the dark web. With new identities in hand, they embarked on a shopping spree at some of the most prestigious stores in New York. The operation itself was sort of sophisticated. During the raid on the pop-out boys in their associates' homes, the authorities found a whole hoard of equipment related to fraudulently creating credit cards. These items included a card printer, a tipper, a card encoder, and multiple embossers. Classic police work like this built and sold the case for the authorities. They conducted raids and collected videos to make their case invincible. They had already been investigating the pop-out boys for months beforehand. The boys didn't help their own case by rapping about it. Using over 2,000 stolen cards, the group purchased around $250,000 worth of items from places like Barney's at Saks. The group was charged with grand larceny and a lot of credit card fraud. They even earned the Donkey of the Day moniker from Charlemagne the God on Breakfast Club. Charlemagne gives the title to anyone who has made a complete fool of themselves. The Pop Out Boys fit that description. Number 6. Game Over Reedy Rena Oliver, better known by her rap name, Game Over Reedy, found herself in a bit of trouble in 2019 when Child Protective Services came knocking. Reedy, who reported feeling unwell, decided to send her kid to school alone in a lift. The driver later stated to police that he told her he couldn't take the child by himself. However, Reedy reportedly went back into her home and didn't return. This prompted the driver to take the kid to the nearest sheriff's office to wash his hands of the issue. At this point, things moved rather quickly, and Reedy was arrested on charges of child endangerment. In Louisiana, this is considered a misdemeanor and carries around a six-month sentence. This was not her only problem, though. Upon further investigation, the authorities found two warrants for outstanding traffic violations on Reedy. Reedy is another honored recipient of the coveted Donkey of the Day moniker given out by The Breakfast Club in the episode Leave Your Kid for the D Challenge. The name references what Reedy originally got famous for. She started an online challenge called For the D that had celebrities like Cardi B joining in. She called herself a trendsetter for it. Thankfully, the Abandon Your Kid in a Lift challenge never caught on. Between the controversy, the warrants, and everyone clowning her, it seems like it's game over for Reedy. Number 5. Pavia Ward Pavia Ward is a rapper from Manchester, UK. In 2020, the artist found herself at the Piccadilly station in Manchester. The staff observed that she was too intoxicated to travel and had the authorities approach Ward and ask her to move along. Ward didn't take too kindly to that. She began cursing and shouting at the staff and officers. She also broke social distancing rules that were in place by getting closer than six feet. The officers had no choice but to remove her by force. When they attempted to escort her outside, she resisted them by struggling and even dropping her weight to make it more difficult. Once they got her out, she went straight back into the station. The officers tried to detain her again, but she was able to slip her handcuffs and yank at her own hair. During the complicated, if not a bit funny, altercation, one of the officers got bit by the wasted rapper. They had already charged her with being drunk and disorderly, but her bold act of defiance could have added assaulting an officer to the list. When asked about her side of the story, Ward claimed that she did everything in self-defense and never did anything wrong. In this modern day, the truth was body cam footage away. The officer's footage showed that everything the staff and authorities said Ward did was true. 
Number 4. Yassine Yassine is a rapper in Sweden who took the scene by storm when he first popped up. He has thousands of people listening to his music every month. However, this isn't to say that he is without controversy. Like many other rappers, Yassine is no stranger to the grittier side of life. He was arrested many times over his young life. Yassine had multiple drug-related offenses in 2015. He was also convicted on gun charges in 2018 and sentenced to two years and three months behind bars. Police also questioned him about the suspicious passing of his friend. So, it was no surprise when the young rapper was once again arrested in connection with another crime in 2020. One of Yassine's rivals, a rapper named Aina, was kidnapped and beaten. During his time with the kidnappers, they took embarrassing photos of him. They used these to try to blackmail Aina, but he didn't pay up, and the images were released. Upon investigation, the police discovered that the crime was committed by a criminal organization named the Varbin Network. As they dug deeper, the authorities connected them with other crimes as well, and before too long, arrests were being made left and right. Shihab Lamori was arrested and charged with leading the criminal network. He got over 17 years for his involvement. Another rival of Yassine's, known as Haval, was given two years and a few months for luring the kidnapping victim to the location where he was captured. Yassine got sentenced to 10 months for passing on instructions concerning the crime. Number 3. Stitches Philip Nicholas Katsabanis is better known by his rap name, Stitches. He got his name due to a unique tattoo that makes his mouth look like it's stitched together. He also has some other tattoos that make him pretty recognizable. His one-of-a-kind look turned around and bit him in the behind when an officer recognized him. He was parked in a handicapped zone, enough reason for cops to approach his car. The officers knew he was liable to have a gun, but he responded with no when asked. He also handed the cops an already burnt joint and apologized for having it. This gave them probable cause to search the vehicle, and they found his secret stash. There were almost 40 grams of marijuana under his seat and a handgun and two magazines. When asked why he lied about the gun, the young man said he misunderstood the question and thought they were asking if he had one on his person. They charged the husband and father of three with possession of a firearm and drugs. Number 2. Nuke Bizzle Nuke Bizzle, or as his mother knows him, Fontrell Antonio Baines, committed multiple crimes in his pursuit of a rapper's glamorous lifestyle. On September 10, 2020, Mr. Bizzle put out a music video on YouTube called EDD. The video was about getting money and seemed to fit right into the genre. The young rapper claimed that he didn't have to grind hard for his money and instead figured out how to take it from the government. He says in his song that other artists have to sell drugs while he just has to file a claim. Later in his trial, this line was directly referenced as evidence of his crimes. He stole over $1 million from the California Employment Development Department, otherwise known as EDD. How did Nuke scam so much money in such a short amount of time? Well, he scammed relief funds meant for people struggling financially through the COVID-19 pandemic. The payouts came in the form of prepaid debit cards in the mail. The rapper used stolen identities to obtain almost 100 cards and spent them on everything under the sun. He purchased merchandise, different services, and straight up withdrew the money. Mr. Bizzle and his entourage were funding their flashy lifestyle with benefits that belonged to other people. They might have gotten away with it too, if not for that pesky music video. However, like some real-life version of the famous Key and Peele sketch, he ratted himself out in the song. Bizzle was arrested on September 23, 2020, while partying in Las Vegas with his ill-gotten gains. He was charged with three felonies, including access device fraud, interstate transportation of stolen property, and aggravated identity theft. If Mr. Bizzle is found guilty on all counts, he could end up spending the next 22 years of his life behind bars. It seems like bragging about scheming the government wasn't Bizzle's best bet. Meanwhile, that's only the tip of the Nuke Bizzle iceberg. Click here for the full video on Nuke Bizzle. Number 1. C. Blue Rapper C. Blue, or Cameron Williams, wears many hats. The young man was an up-and-coming rapper and well-known Crip member. He's also a criminal with gun possession charges. In January of 2022, he added assault to his rap sheet. On January 18th, officers responded to a call about Mr. Blue causing a disturbance. They approached the young man and ordered him to remove his hands from his pockets. When he didn't comply, the cops struggled with him. During the ensuing fight, a gun went off and, in a Cheddar Bob-like moment, hit one of the officers and C. Blue himself. 
At this point, both people were rushed to the hospital and were ultimately okay. The wounded officer left the hospital to the cheers of his partners, while Blue went straight to jail without passing go. He was already on probation for gun possession charges from 2020, yet his lawyer somehow managed to get bail set, even when the prosecution wanted Blue to stay in jail. He posted the $250,000 bail and left the same night he went in. This added to an already growing controversy surrounding Judge Dennis Boyle, who has apparently allowed several violent offenders to walk in New York. Here are a few of the worst girls on Instagram. Number 9. Jeannie Exum Jeannie Exum, whose name sounds like a fantasy novel, was an Instagram and OnlyFans model. She was also a crazy person who went after her boyfriend with a particularly sharp kitchen utensil. When the NYPD showed up at her apartment, he told them they got into an argument and she attacked him in the arm and back with a kitchen knife. Luckily for him, he was taken to the hospital and survived. He was also a social media influencer who went by Baby Boy Pedrulis. Police arrested Exum and charged her with the crime. However, she got right out after being released without bail. She agreed to a no-contact order, which prevented her from speaking to her boyfriend or coming near him. For her 36,000 followers, she posted a picture with the police caption, quote, They took my phone, y'all. I'm on the trap right now. Whatever that means. Hurting her boyfriend was a good career move since her follower base doubled after the incident. She recently stated that she's seeing two therapists. Number 8. Bianca Chia Bianca Chia, a model and Instagram influencer, was arrested by Australian border police. They charged her with two counts of fraud for tricking investors out of a million dollars. Clearly, she was branching out from just taking pictures with products on social media. Her Instagram is no longer up, but this 40-year-old wellness guru had 1.3 million followers at her peak. She's being accused of misleading investors in her online business, Sportlux. Apparently, these investors didn't care about the company's dumb name, but they did care when they noticed her financial situation was more than suspicious. She could go to jail for up to two years, which wouldn't be great for her Instagram career. Investors say Chia lied about how much money she made from modeling and product placement on Instagram. A court found that she and her husband broke Australian consumer law and ordered them to repay the investors' funds. However, instead of paying them back, they declared bankruptcy. Before getting arrested, Chia told her Instagram followers that she would be taking a step back from social media to focus on her family. She said she hadn't been posting as much because she wanted to spend more time with her son. Surely it had nothing at all to do with her massive legal issues. Fraud, court battles, and bankruptcy didn't go with her wellness persona. Number 7. Gabby Castillo Gabby Castillo's Instagram page didn't reflect reality. It was mostly just pictures of her wearing bikinis and taking selfies at the gym. More or less your run-of-the-mill Instagram hottie. However, she got arrested for being a suspected member of Union Tepito, a Mexican street gang. At the time of her arrest, she had 763,000 Instagram followers. Now, her Instagram doesn't exist. Mexican police charged her with drug-related offenses and fraud associated with buying luxury cars. This was not a good time for her to get arrested as she was launching her singing career under the name Brela Sands. When the police caught up with her in Mexico, she had 1 million pesos in her car. To make matters worse, police found copious amounts of drugs in her car, a car she bought with a fake check. She's also being investigated for taking compromising pictures with clients that she would then use to blackmail them for money. The cherry on top? She's been romantically linked to the leader of Union Tepito, who's currently serving a 20-year sentence for multiple violent offenses. Number 6. Julia Rose in 2021, Julia Rose and five of her pals were arrested after they changed the Hollywood sign to say Holly Boob. Holly Boob might be funnier than Hollywood, but LAPD still didn't approve. They used a tarp to put a B over the W and a line through the D. This wasn't Rose's first publicity stunt, and it probably won't be her last. At the 2019 World Series, she flashed a picture. Rose claims the entire stunt was to raise awareness for breast cancer, a notable cause, but one you can take with a grain of salt since Rose also runs an adult magazine. Maybe it would be more plausible if she ran a breast cancer charity. The sign wasn't altered permanently, so she only got arrested for misdemeanor trespassing and police released her rather quickly. The Hollywood sign is a frequent target for vandalism because of how famous and accessible it is. Anyone can walk up the hill. There are cameras, but there aren't usually police actively patrolling the area. In 2017, someone changed it to say Hollyweed. Number five, Yoon Lucy Lu Lee. 
Last year, Hungarian police released images of Instagram influencer Yun Lu Li and her boyfriend being arrested. They managed to stay on the run and dodged the authorities for three months before police caught them in Budapest. Police wanted them for the death of their business associate, Tyler Pratt. The incident, an extended hide-and-seek game with the cops, earned them a new nickname. They were the millennial Bonnie and Clyde to the media. As if this wasn't bad enough, they tried to hurt Pratt's girlfriend and unborn child. She made no effort to change her appearance while they ran. This means she was either delusional about her chances of getting away, or just so vain that she couldn't bring herself to get a haircut or anything like that. The lovers hid out in Czech Republic and Slovakia before eventually going to Hungary. It's thought that Lee and her boyfriend both knew Pratt, and they took his life during what was supposed to be a business meeting. Lee is the daughter of a very wealthy and politically influential Canadian businesswoman. Lee consented to deportation from Hungary back to Canada. Her boyfriend, however, who is a Slovakian citizen, is trying to fight extradition rather than face justice. Lee has two twin sisters. They may share an appearance, but they don't share Lee's lust for crime. The three of them built a social media following together, posting pictures of themselves wearing matching bikinis. Lee's family issued a statement saying they were shocked and disturbed by the incident. They never saw it coming. Pratt probably didn't either. This was Lee's first time hurting someone, but it was not her boyfriend's. In 2014, he was found guilty of a fatal drunk driving accident for which he got five years in prison. To this day, nobody knows why they did it or what went wrong during that meeting. Number 4. Danielle Miller Danielle Miller, an Instagram influencer from Miami, had 34,000 followers. Now, she's been charged with wire fraud. Most of her posts are being used against her in court. According to U.S. Attorney's Office, an investigation into Danielle by Homeland Security showed that she had stolen someone's identity by getting into their Registry of Motor Vehicles account. She then used all the information she stole from them to open a bank account and apply for a pandemic-related economic injury disaster loan. Her Instagram influencer career had not been affected by the pandemic at all. More than $100,000 was deposited into the bank account she had set up. Then, she took a private flight from Florida to California using the stolen identity. After getting this huge loan, she started posting all kinds of photos of herself in different luxury hotels in California. These are the posts that ended up getting used in court. They proved the money she received from her stolen identity scam paid for her luxury rooms. It's pretty hard to deny such concrete evidence. She basically snitched on herself. Her fraud may not have stopped at just one victim. The IP address used to apply for the loan was also used to access the online RMV accounts for a few other people. She used their identities to apply for nearly a million dollars worth of loans. She could face up to 20 years in prison and a quarter million dollar fine if she's convicted, but at least she got some good picks out of the deal. Number three, Kelly K. Green. At the 2020 Super Bowl, Kelly K. Green tried to get on the field, and security arrested her for trespassing. Fans are not allowed on the field, no matter how many Instagram followers they have. K., who had 348,000 followers, saw the opportunity for a publicity stunt. K. jumped over the rail, walked onto the field. She didn't make it very far before security took her into custody. Videos of the incident were all over social media, which may have been her plan all along. Police arrested her near one of the end zones and led her off the field. As they led her away in handcuffs, she managed to pull her dress up and show everyone her butt. Kay spent the night in jail and was released in a $1,000 bond. Perhaps she just wanted to know what it felt like to play football. Security tackled her like a linebacker in the Kansas City Chiefs end zone. So it sounds like she got her way. Number two, Kayla Massa. Kayla Massa was an Instagram and YouTube influencer known online as Kay Goldie. Her Instagram account, which has since been deleted, had roughly 330,000 followers when it was active. She also had around 107 subscribers on YouTube, where she posted vlogs, hair tutorials, and that sort of thing. She seemed pretty inconspicuous. But then, she tried to steal $1.5 million from her followers. She used Instagram to promote her scheme. She shared pictures of money, screenshots of bank balances, and other things. Then she would make a post saying something like, if you got a bank account and you're interested in making legal money, hit me up ASAP. Some of her followers were dumb enough to message her. She would tell them that they could earn $5,000 by letting her friend use their bank account for a short period. Then she asked for an emptied out bank card and their pin, which she used to deposit the stolen money. Then she'd place $1,000 money orders and would draw the cash when it came through. Once the bank realized it was fraudulent, they recalled the money, leaving the victim with a negative balance of $1,000. Massa got hers, the bank got theirs, and the victims, who were mostly under 18 years old, were left holding the bag.
Number one, Marcella Zoea. In 2019, Instagram model Marcella Zoea threw an Ikea chair off a condo tower near the Gardner Expressway in Toronto. Why would someone do this? For the internet cloud, of course. Someone recorded this chair throwing on their phone and posted it on Snapchat. She said she wasn't the one who actually posted it in court. We don't really believe her, but that's beside the point. In court, the judge roasted her pretty hard. She said Marcella had committed a hazardous act for her own pleasure and vanity, which is pretty much a perfect description of what she did. The judge also said the chair throwing was part of a disturbing trend, the trend of people acting like idiots to get attention on Instagram. Marcella had to pay a $2,000 fine, do 150 hours of community service, and stay on probation for two years. The judge wanted to send a message. That message is that posting videos of yourself breaking the law is a great way to get caught. And if you get caught, you can face serious legal consequences. It could have been much worse. Marcella could have gotten six months of jail time, but the judge decided that since Marcella was young and could probably act smarter in the future, she didn't need to go to jail. However, she'll live in infamy as chair girl outside her fan base. She's just lucky her chair didn't hurt anybody on the way down. Here are a few people who completely exposed themselves. Number 10, David Guerra. Someone should have told David that you shouldn't post evidence of your crimes on social media. This genius from San Antonio's Southside posed for the camera holding cash, guns, and let's call it illegal substances because, uh, thanks YouTube censors. Clearly, David was looking for attention and he got it. Shortly after he posted the images came to the attention of the Bexar County Sheriff's Department. They sent three different divisions after Guerra and it didn't take long for them to find his car and pull him over. In the car, they found illegal substances, a loaded gun, and cash. The sheriffs also found another man in the car with them, Urza Guerra. They arrested them both. We don't think they let you post on Instagram from jail, so we may not hear from them for a while. Number 9. Paula Asher it was bad enough that a Kentucky woman made the awful choice to drive drunk. But when Paula Asher slammed into a car filled with four teenagers, she made things even worse by driving away. Police inevitably caught up with her and charged her with four crimes. Driving under the influence, leaving the scene of an accident, driving under the influence of alcohol, and possession of a controlled substance. Asher didn't keep quiet afterwards, though her lawyer probably wishes she did. In her infinite wisdom, she decided to post on Facebook about how she got drunk and hit another car. She made sure to end the post with the signature LOL. It's one thing to make terrible choices. It's something entirely worse to laugh out loud about them on social media. Outraged family saw and shared the post with the judge in the case. The judge was, shall we say, unhappy. When Judge Mary Jane Phelps saw Asher in court for the first time, she told her to delete that Facebook account. But Asher did not delete her Facebook account. Another in a series of unwise decisions. When the judge found out, Asher was found in contempt of court and sentenced to spend two days in the county jail. In another DUI or LOL moment, Oregon teen Jacob Cox Brown had a serious wake-up call driving drunk. He too joked about his crime on Facebook when he wrote, Driving drunk, classic. But I am sorry to whoever's vehicle I hit. He ended the post with a sticking your tongue out emoji. Two of his Facebook friends shared the post with police who promptly arrested Jacob. When you post something like that, you've got to assume it won't stay private for long. Number eight, Nicholas Grove. He did not want to go to jail. So when cops brought him in for booking, he decided to run away. He was originally arrested for stealing computers, checks, and credit cards from an Oregon Education District building. Nicholas couldn't bear the thought of prison, so as they were booking him, he hopped over a counter and ran away. Freedom didn't last long. They scooped him back up later that summer and booked him, successfully this time, to await trial. Still, Grove was determined. Grove seized another opportunity in the rec yard by climbing over the fence, a fence topped with razor wire, and went on the run again. This time, he made it to Mexico. Maybe Nicholas thought that he was Andy DeFresne, the character from The Shawshank Redemption who broke out of prison to live out his days in Mexico. He wasn't. If you watch the movie carefully, you'll notice that Andy DeFresne never posted anything on Facebook. But while Nicholas lived a life of freedom in Mexico, he just kept posting. He posted selfies of himself in and around Cancun, which made it pretty easy for police to find him once they got the info from Facebook. A year and a half later, U.S. Marshals swooped in to Tulum, Mexico and picked up the fugitive. They hauled him back to Oregon to face trial for his original crimes and a new one, felony escape. He got five years. Number seven, Dakari McAniff. 
A Los Angeles man named Dakari McCaniff thought he cracked the code to get famous on social media. For some reason, he felt the secret to Twitter fame involved showing the world your gun and aiming it at people. Then he said if he got 100 retweets, he'd use it on someone. It didn't take long for cops to figure out who posted the image and caption on Twitter. It also didn't take long for them to arrest McCaniff and bring him to jail. We don't know how long it'll take for this Los Angeles sniper to learn his lesson, but we doubt he'll post about it when he does. Number six, Orlando Henderson. He just loved to flaunt his luxury lifestyle on social media. He took pictures of himself next to his brand new Mercedes and posted them claiming to be building his brand. He also posted pictures of himself holding huge stacks of cash. While he posted like a famous rapper, Orlando was a lowly bank teller in North Carolina. We're not sure how many likes he got, but we do know the FBI were not his biggest fans. However, Henderson was pretty brave in his plot to rob his own bank. He just walked into the vault, grabbed people's cash, and deposited it into his account at an ATM around the corner. In all, he made off with $88,000. He put $20,000 down to buy the new Mercedes that he proudly posed with for social media. Once the FBI got involved, Orlando's life of luxury came crumbling down. Orlando was charged with a few counts of fraud and 19 separate counts of theft and embezzlement. With decades in prison and millions of dollars in fines heading his way, Orlando probably wishes he stayed off social media. Find out more about Orlando by clicking here. Number five, Lee Van Bryan. After a long flight from London, Lee Van Bryan landed in Los Angeles with his friend Emily Bunting. Lee and Emily made it through passport control. However, less than friendly Homeland Security agents prevented them from taking another step. In this case, it wasn't that Lee and Emily had done something. It wasn't even that they were planning to do something. Instead, border agents detained and grilled them over some cheeky tweets Lee posted before traveling to LA. Before leaving, he posted about how he would destroy America and dig up Marilyn Monroe's grave. Not exactly wise, but still just a tweet. What the border agents didn't understand, according to Lee, is that destroy is slang for party. So when he tweeted that he was going to destroy America, he was talking about partying. Oh, and he didn't mean it when he tweeted three weeks prior that they were going to Hollywood Boulevard to upset people and dig up Marilyn Monroe's grave. In fairness, maybe it was all a big misunderstanding. It seems likely that Lee and Emily were traveling to LA to have fun and party. And as they pointed out to the border agents, digging up Marilyn Monroe's grave is a joke. He lived from the show Family Guy. The Department of Homeland Security was having none of it though. So instead of a hearty welcome to America, they got a trip in a police van and an overnight stay in a holding cell. Lee met some nice men in his holding cell who were allegedly huge and covered with tattoos. They told him they'd been arrested for smuggling substances into the country. Then they took his dinner. The next day it was back to the airport for Lee and his friend where they were sent home on a jet. Number four, Dominic Alfonseca. Dominic will have you know he's the victim in this story. All he did was walk into a bank and ask for some money. He smiled at the teller and handed her a note. He said please and thank you. What we know at this point is that Dominic was a very polite bank robber. His note, though, was a little more urgent. It said he needed the money right now because it only takes the police three or four minutes to arrive. Then it said to ring the alarm a minute after he's gone and make sure the money doesn't blow up on his way out. He even put a little smiley face at the end. He walked out with a bag full of cash and was arrested 22 minutes later. Alfonseca didn't waste those 22 minutes. That was all the time he needed to make a couple of of Instagram posts sharing videos of the robbery and a photo of the note he'd given the teller. The reason why Alfonseca believed he was the victim is pretty simple. He never threatened the teller or anyone else. He just politely asked for the money. It's not his fault she was generous. Nothing to do with the fact that he was an aspiring rapper who posted the photo and videos for exposure. Not one to miss an opportunity, Alfonseca took some time in a jailhouse interview to give shoutouts to Michelle Obama, Justin Bieber, and Lady Gaga. Number three, Augustine Nadru. On a sunny January afternoon on Staten Island, Augustine made a little clip for his Instagram followers. He filmed himself strolling down the sidewalk and chatting with a postal service worker. Then he filmed himself walking into a bank and telling a cashier how lovely she was. He was careful to say he was a one-woman man, but if he weren't, he would marry her. Finally, Augustine turned to the room and shouted at the top of his lungs, This is a robbery! Then he left. Augustine didn't stick around to get any money. If he had, things would have gotten a lot worse for him. Even so, the police were happy to charge him with several crimes. In a hilarious twist, this was the second bank he, quote, robbed that day. He also had an open case from 2018 in which he walked into another bank and pulled the same stunt. In the end, he was charged with reckless endangerment. Police also found a little bit of weed on him, which was still illegal at the time. Number two, Harim Shah. 
Some people never learn. Take this Pakistani TikTok star, for instance. In 2019, Shah filmed herself in the conference room of Pakistan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, something that's strictly forbidden. If she just kept quiet, she'd probably get away with it. But that's not what TikTok celebrities do. Instead, Shah did the opposite. She posted it on TikTok for her 1 million plus followers, prompting outrage and criticism on social media. The government launched a small investigation, but she never suffered any consequences. She got away with it this time. After a brush with the law, you'd think that Shah would be cautious about what she posted online. But in January of 2022, she did it again. Shaw posted pics of herself after arriving in London carrying loads of cash. In the video, she claimed she brought it illegally from her native Pakistan. This time, though, she took things even further. She told her followers that even though they should be careful if they did something like that, it was easy for her and they could not stop her. She even said that in Pakistan, the laws are only for the poor. We can't say for sure if Shah learned from this. Still, nobody likes a gloater. This time, the outrage was loud enough that Pakistan's feds launched a money laundering investigation into Shah's activity. That's when things got uncomfortable. A prominent Pakistani politician step forward in Shah's defense in an unexpected twist. Daniel Malik, a former candidate for one of Pakistan's larger political parties and a businessman in London, told the press that the cash was his and he'd loaned it to Shah as a friend so she could make a fun little video for the internet. According to Danielle, the cash was all for legitimate business and Shah did nothing wrong. This must be true. When has a politician ever stretched the truth? Number one, Andrew Hennels. Andrew went on Facebook and posted about his plan to rob his local Tesco supermarket. He must have made the post moments before walking into the store because just 15 minutes later, police had him in custody. He managed to steal a getaway car in that short window and drove to a local pub. When police picked him up, they found the weapon he used to threaten the clerk and the 400 pounds he'd stolen from the store. The police seemed grateful for the Facebook post. To them, the pictures and posts confirmed what they already knew. They're some of the biggest Playboy scammers. Let's get right into their scams and what they do with the money. Number five, not a scammer. Playboy Karan Mishra is an alleged fraudster that scammed older people worldwide out of their life savings. Mishra lived a lavish lifestyle that he bragged about on Instagram and Facebook. He used social media to share his global jet setting, took pictures with luxury cars, and always wore expensive designer clothes. YouTuber Jim Browning revealed Mishra's crimes to the world in a 2021 interview with the Daily Mail. He exposed Mishra for ripping off British pensioners. Browning hacked Mishra's phone call center in India and obtained records where Mishra spoke about his greed, talking about how when you first start making money, all you want to do is make more. He said he needed a private jet, but had to make more money first. He bragged about things he liked to buy, including drinking Blue Label Johnny Walker whiskey worth $750. Browning runs a YouTube channel that exposes scams and has even led to some arrests. He took to YouTube several years ago so that he could warn others of all the scams that were out there. Three years later, he started hacking scammers' computers and sharing the results on his channel. He goes along with frauds, giving fake names and credit card numbers so that the scammers don't suspect him. One of Mishra's victims was Thomas Mulligan, an elderly retired former surgeon for the British National Health Service. Mulligan received a phone call on his landline from an Amazon cybersecurity representative that wanted him to help stop hackers. However, Mulligan was not speaking to an Amazon representative at all. He was on the phone with Mishra, talking to the criminal he was supposed to be helping stop. He trusted Mishra, who already knew his bank details. Mishra told him he was being chased for outstanding debt because the scammers used his account. He pressured Mulligan into paying 10,000 pounds into a specific bank account so that they could use it to chase the money and find the criminals. Afterward, he would be given a full refund. Mishra instructed him to download software to help track the criminals, and Mulligan unwittingly gave Mishra access to everything on his computer, including personal documents. Browning was watching Mishra at the time and caught him amid his scam. He contacted Mulligan and stopped the transaction. 
Mishra scammed his victims of millions of dollars. He did this by coaxing them into downloading TeamViewer, the software that would give him access to their computers and cell phones. Once he had the victims' account information, he drained them of their savings. When Browning hacked into Mishra's computer, he found spreadsheets with thousands of customers' details, including passwords and account numbers. Mishra had scripts that served as guides on how to scam victims by gaining their trust. He also had logos for major companies to seem more valid. One of the scripts had Mishra pose as an employee who needed to warn victims that hackers in Nigeria access their computer's IP addresses and gained access to all their financial details and personal information. Some of the files on his laptop had selfies of him posing with an expensive watch and pictures taken at a call center, although it can't be confirmed if that's where he committed his crimes. Other files contained pictures of personal documents and a meme of a room covered in cash that said, the only room I would like to clean. There are fraudulent call centers that buy victims' personal information, like their dates of births and addresses, and then sell it to other scammers. The Daily Mail broke his story. Despite all of the evidence against him, when they confronted him at his home in Kolkata, India, he denied all accusations, telling reporters that all he did for work was run stationary shops in India with his father. Number four, Sullied Enterprises. Marco Perez, also known as Sully Perez, was the founder and director of Permian Basin Propens, Inc. The company was supposed to sell propens, like sand, for fracking operations, but that was a front for a Ponzi scheme. He solicited investor money by misrepresenting his company and ran the operation from 2017 until 2022. Perez made $14 million off the scheme and put the funds towards elaborate personal purchases, like his wedding, property, vacations, a helicopter, and luxury vehicles. He liked the travel in style and bought many cars, including a Rolls Royce, a BMW, and a Cadillac Escalade. He told investors that their money would go towards purchasing discounted frac sand, which would then be resold at a profit to fracking operations around and in the Permian Basin. The Permian Basin is the largest sedimentary basin in western Texas and southeastern New Mexico. It has natural gas, rich petroleum, and potassium deposits. It's drilled by oil producers like Chevron. He promised them guaranteed substantial returns on their investments and that they'd get all of their money back plus the profits from the resale. His pitch was enticing to investors, particularly as he told them they would get their money back quickly. Perez's scheme was a classic Ponzi scheme. He used investor money for his personal expenses and kept the scheme running by using a portion of new investor money to pay previous investors. He was investigated by the FBI and the Securities Exchange and Commission who uncovered the truth behind his scheme. In April 2022, he pleaded guilty to engaging in monetary transactions property derived from specified unlawful activities and one count of wire fraud. He was sentenced to 163 months in prison in order to pay $14 million in restitution. Number three, mining nothing. Mining Capital Coin was supposed to be a cryptocurrency mining and investment platform, but its CEO, Louis Capucci, used it to orchestrate a $62 million worldwide investment fraud scheme. He lured investors with mining packages, a network of cryptocurrency mines with a guaranteed weekly return on investment. Another product he sold was trading bots, which he claimed could make thousands of trades per second and give investors daily returns. The company began in 2017, and Capucci built a strong network of investors when he promised that if they invested a minimum of $125 that day, they'd get a 1% return every day indefinitely. Those profits would come from trading cryptocurrencies, traditional stocks, and Bitcoin mining. He worked with a business partner, Emerson Pyers. The cost of Bitcoin mining machines is upwards of $4,000, and the pair claimed they owned more than 4,500 of those machines. They showcased the machines in videos on social media where they shouted over the sound of the motors whirring in the background. Capucci knew how to make his business look legitimate. He lied about his background, saying that he studied computer science at Harvard University and then worked for the FBI for eight years. He bragged about the company's charitable work, saying that he partnered with the Clinton Foundation and the World Bank. Crypto blogger Peter Obi reviewed the mining platform. He calculated that MCC's $50 monthly membership and 3% withdrawal fee made it unlikely for investors to make money without referring other investors. MCC's referral process was similar to other crypto scams he had researched. Capucci and Pyers had over 65,000 investors who invested $62 million. The partners paid themselves monthly Bitcoin salaries ranging from $5,000 to 
dollars. They made extravagant purchases. Capucci bought a Lamborghini, two Ferraris, a yacht, a Mercedes, and $10,000 worth of designer clothes. Hires purchased a Lamborghini, a Mercedes, a Harley Davidson, and a Land Rover. When Capucci's third wife became pregnant in 2020, he threw a gender reveal party where two Ferraris and a Lamborghini shot blue smoke out of the exhaust pipes, elaborately telling their guests that the couple was having a boy. Capucci's son's first birthday party was over the top, and he even had a live giraffe. His outrageous displays of wealth alarmed his daughter-in-law, Caitlin Capucci. They went shopping together, and he offered to buy her whatever she wanted. She seemed uncomfortable, prompting him to open his bank account on his phone to show her that he had $4 billion. She didn't understand where the money came from. All that she knew was that it kept growing. Investors were initially told they could cash out on BitChain whenever they wanted. But whenever they went to cash out, there were delays and roadblocks. Capucci said to them that the issues was with BitChain, which was building new internet faces slowing down transfers and withdrawals. Capucci's life began to fall apart. According to court documents obtained by the Daily Beast, he was sued in Lucy County Court for failure to repay an $11,000 loan from 2015. He failed to pay $25,127 in rent on one of his other businesses. He divorced his second wife in 2019, and his ex-wife claimed he stopped paying the mortgage on their home despite it being a part of the divorce agreement. When asked why he hadn't paid it, he said he didn't want to. The Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, filed a 25-page lawsuit against Capucci and in the suit, the commission accused them of running a fraudulent company that scammed investors. When Pyers spoke with investigators, he admitted that the business was never in operation in the U.S., and the SEC found in their investigations that it wasn't a real business. Capital Coin was the cryptocurrency Capucci invented and paid his investors in, which was found to be worthless. BitChain, the platform that investors used for cashouts, was owned by Capucci too. He registered BitChain's website and then paid to ensure the registration was private. When the SEC issued subpoenas against MCC, Capucci immediately shut down bank accounts, offloaded his assets, and sold his belongings, including two properties, a car, and his yacht. At the time of the subpoena, he had six different bank accounts, two PayPal accounts, and dozens of digital wallets. He operated bank accounts in the name of the other 17 companies he claimed to own. He had $18.5 million in crypto assets when MCC was active. Pyres and Capucci fled to Brazil when they were served by the SEC. In May 2022, Capucci was charged with cons conspiracy to commit wire fraud, conspiracy to commit securities fraud, and conspiracy to commit international money laundering. He denies all allegations. His trial is ongoing, and he faces up to 45 years in prison for his crimes. Number two, Wolf of Old Hall Street. Stephen Evans was named the Wolf of Old Hall Street after he engaged in a Ponzi scam where he stole 4.4 million pounds. Evans ran his fraudulent company in Liverpool, but his influence reached as far as the United Arab Emirates, where many of his victims were. He convinced investors to hand over large sums of money so that he could invest it on their behalf, but used it for his own gains instead. Evans went to prison for his crimes in 2014. Evans lived in the UAE and worked as a financial advisor and stockbroker from 2007 until 2010. He soon created Stephen Evans Investments Limited, also known as SE Investments, when he began scamming clients he lived in Dubai and the Isle of Man for tax purposes. The Isle of Man is a British dependency between England and Ireland in the Irish Sea. He convinced his clients to give him money to be invested. His past work experience made investors trust him, and they had no idea that their money was being used for different purposes. Like most Ponzi schemes, he was under pressure from old investors who wanted to know where their money was. Evans used money from new investors to pay the old ones. One man gave him 3.7 million pounds and never got his money back. Investors supported Evans' luxurious lifestyle. Between 2010 and 2013, he made countless elaborate purchases. He bought 20 luxury cars, including a lime green Lamborghini for himself and a Porsche 911 for his girlfriend. He bought corporate sponsorship deals at Liverpool and Everton soccer clubs. He burned through 4.4 million pounds, spending 1.5 million pounds on luxury cars, 36,000 pounds on yachts, 300,000 pounds on jewelry, and 250,000 pounds on a racehorse. His extreme purchases didn't end there. 
He spent 280,000 pounds on travel expenses, including chauffeurs, flights, and hotels. He rented properties at exclusive addresses and wore designer clothing like handmade bespoke suits. He bought a racehorse that he called Fat Gary. Not only did he have to pay the initial 250,000 pounds for the animal, but he also needed to cover 50,000 pounds in stabling fees and gave 15,000 pounds to Chester Racecourse to sponsor a race under the Fat Gary banner. He didn't spend all of the stolen money on himself. His charitable donations included almost 60,000 pounds to Marina Dalglish's cancer appeal and 52,000 pounds to celebrity hairdresser Herbert Howe's charity. 2012, one of his clients hired a private detective who started tracking Evans. He turned himself into police custody and he was tried at Liverpool Crown Court. His lawyer, Christopher Stables, defended him by saying that Evans was reeled in by the extravagance of the lifestyle and couldn't uh, stop himself. He painted the picture that Evans was addicted to being a big spender and the perks of being wealthy. Judge Watson sentenced him to five years and three months in jail, holding him accountable for his actions and how he used his charm to lure his clients. Life was different when Evans left prison. He no longer had millions of pounds to spend. He worked part-time at an outdoor adventure center for Bendring Trust, a local charity. Neighbors also said he worked in London, where he was seen buying watches and jewelry. He kept a low profile in his neighborhood, barely interacting with neighbors, running from his car to his house. He lived alone in a small house, a far cry from the life he once knew. In October 2022, police officers found his body in his home. Evans was 38 years old, and the cause of his death is yet to be released. Number 1. Atunba Cash in October 2018, Atun Bakash was arrested by Turkish police. Danish police contacted Turkish police via Interpol to tell them that there had been unauthorized access to a company named GM Plast's email. Inside the mail was proof that the company had paid large sums into a Turkish bank account. Atunba changed his name from Emmanuel Aneki to Atun Bakash. Nigerian-born Cash became a socialite around 2017 and 2018 when he was seen hanging out in the best clubs where he was a big spender, buying expensive bottles of wine and enjoying the party life. Nobody knew where his money came from. Some thought he was related to wealthy politicians or got rich through an undisclosed business venture. In October 2018, Cash's true source of revenue was unveiled when Turkish police arrested him while he was staying at a luxury hotel. He had several accomplices but was the brains behind the operation. The group impersonated different companies and sent emails to victims who input personal information into what they thought were legitimate companies. They were running a phishing scheme and stole $1.4 million from victims. When the police raided the luxury hotel that Cash was staying in, they confiscated many items, including one Rolex watch, a luxury car, $85,000, and 5,000 euros. Danish police caught Cash's suspicious activity and passed it along to Turkish authorities. Cash was arrested along with his scammer friends. They're still in prison and expected to stay there for a long time. In May of 2020, 38-year-old love and hip-hop star Maurice Mofane pleaded guilty to several different types of financial crimes. It did not take him and his attorneys long to negotiate Fane's sentencing. Mofane was sentenced to 17 years in prison for conspiracy, wire fraud, bank fraud, making false statements to get a business loan through the PPP system. But who did he defraud? How did he do it? And what does all this illegal financial activity have to do with COVID. Before we discuss Mo Fane's schemes, we need to learn more about the star himself. Love and Hip Hop is a reality TV show detailing the daily lives of hip hop stars, their significant others, and all the drama that ensues from their often chaotic musical lifestyles. Mo Fane, also known as Arkansas Mo, was a member of the Love and Hip Hop Atlanta cast for a short time as the love interest to longtime star Carly Red. Nevertheless, it was long enough to establish his celebrity status. After leaving the show, Fane, who had already achieved a decent level of fame amongst the viewers of love and hip-hop, decided to leverage his notoriety to start a company. This type of career move is a common brand-building strategy for reality stars, like the Kardashians, who sell several different types of clothing lines and makeup products to their adoring fans year in and year out, bringing in billions in sales revenue. However, instead of selling clothes, Fane announced to investors that he would start a trucking business called Flame Trucking, and that's where things 
all went wrong. Fain eventually got 20 investors to pour millions of dollars into his trucking business in return for a stake in the company. By the nature of investing, they expected to be paid back in future profits. But once Fain received the capital, he went on a spending spree. On one trip to a casino in Oklahoma, Fain blew over $5 million. He spent the rest funding his lavish lifestyle, gaining the impression that the reality TV star was still living the high life. Perhaps he wanted to prove he could make it as an entrepreneur and wasn't just riding the coattails of reality TV. Ironically, Fain also used his investors' money to pay off personal debts, while almost no money went into funding his trucking business. With all of his investors' money tied up in casinos and other luxuries, the Ponzi schemer needed to find a way to pay them back. Speaking of bad decisions, let's talk about bad habits real quick. This guy definitely needed to get his bad habits under control. We all know he wouldn't have felt the need to run a scam if he'd only developed proper finance habits. That's why we're proud to introduce today's sponsor, Fabulous, the number one self-care app designed to help you build better habits and achieve your goals. Both habit changing and habit building can be extremely difficult, but Fabulous helps you do so in a fabulously simple, easy to use approach so that you can start feeling healthier, fulfilled, and more productive. Unlike most of the scammers you'll see in this video. This isn't just another app with basic reminders. Their methods are all based on behavioral science breaking down scientifically proven healthy habits into tiny tasks that you can achieve every single day. Better yet, you can go at your own pace. Their supportive methods makes the entire process gentler and more rewarding. You can choose between a guided or self-guided approach so that your entire experience is completely 100% personalized. So, why not get started on building your ideal daily routine today? The first 100 people to click on the link in the description below will get 25% off a fabulous premium subscription. Fain kept his scam running from 2013 to 2020. During that time, he used new investor money to pay off old investors, the good old textbook Ponzi scheme. However, as like all Ponzi schemes, the well ran dry, and the walls closed in on Fain and his scams. Fain needed more money, and the COVID-19 pandemic made that even harder. Or did it? With the pandemic shutting everything down, Fain had no way of making any money, especially with his trucking business, which had to shut down due to COVID restrictions. At least he couldn't go to the casino anymore. So we guess that helped in a roundabout way. Then on April 3rd, 2020, the United States government created the PPP loan program. For Fain, the PPP loan was his way out. Acting U.S. Attorney Kurt R. Erskine had this to say, quote, Fain planned to use the PPP program as a cover for his long-running Ponzi scheme. The funds the program supplies serve as a lifeline to many businesses trying to stay afloat during the pandemic. Unfortunately, his fraud helped deplete those precious dollars. The the pandemic put many Americans in a tough spot financially. Many working people lost their jobs. Business owners lost their income stream and built up significant amounts of debt in the process. To help those affected by the shutdown and economic turmoil, the government offered aid to businesses so they could pay their employees and expenses. This aid has come through PPP Loans, which stands for Paycheck Protection Program. To get a PPP loan, all you would need to do is verify the needs of your business through legal documents that detail the numbers on your payroll. If you can prove that you lack the funds to pay your employees, the government will issue a forgivable loan. If you use the money to pay your employees and business expenses only, then you don't have to pay it back. While the PPP loans kept small businesses afloat, they opened the doors to scammers and con artists alike. The amount of money you received was based on your monthly payroll expenses. The more employees you have, the more you spend on payroll. The more you spend on payroll, the bigger your PPP check is from the government. Fain saw an opportunity to use his trucking business to steal more money from our financial system. He claimed to have 107 employees who all commanded a monthly payroll of $1,490,200. These claims, of course, were not even remotely true. Some quick math tells us that his 107 employees, on average, were making almost $14,000 per month. The application was asking for enough relief money to help pay Fain's business expenses, or as the U.S. Attorney's Office 
office explains, retain workers and maintain payroll or make mortgage interest payments, lease payments, and utility payments related to his trucking business, which Fain believed 3.7 million would be enough to cover his business expenses. He submitted an application for that amount using the near 1.5 million payroll expenses as proof. Though the claims were false, they were still convincing enough to give Fain the multi-million dollar loan. Though they denied him his initial request of 3.7 million, the SBA ended up giving Fain a little over 2 million for his 107 employees. Now that Fain finally had some money, he could fix the damage he caused with his Ponzi scheme by paying back the investors he stole from. True to his character, Fain did the opposite. When the time came, Fain spent the money on items that would increase his status. Fain went on another shopping spree when the PPP money landed in his bank account. He started out by leasing a Rolls Royce Wraith for $136,000, which is a a lot when you consider it's a lease. Fain, of course, didn't just lease fancy items. He bought some, too, including $85,000 worth of custom-made jewelry. Among the custom-made jewelry, Fain bought a Rolex presidential watch, a diamond bracelet, and a 5.37 carat diamond ring. However, not all of Fain's PPP loan went towards diamonds and Rolls Royces. He also took out $65,000 in cold hard cash. Authorities reportedly found an additional $85,000 in Fain's house after his arrest. He also seemed to have used the funds to start another business to go with flame trucking, which was more like barely sparking trucking at this point in the pandemic. In a hilariously responsible move, Fain did spend $230,000 of the $2 million PPP loan loan to keep his Ponzi scheme going. But he did that just to get people off his back. In addition to the $230,000, Fain spent an even smaller fraction, roughly 50 grand, to finally pay off restitution in a fraud case from way back. He even paid off some of his debts, including $40,000 in past due child support money he owed. But despite some of the money going towards repaying victims of his scheme, the $200,000 plus wasn't enough to cover up the millions he owed to investors. Eventually, the FBI started investigating Fain finally discovering the obvious irregularities in his financial activities after he obtained the PPP loan in the spring of 2020. A year later, in the spring of 2021, Fain was charged and sentenced to 17 years on all counts. Chris Hacker, an FBI special agent in Atlanta, said Fain was used as an example of what will happen to anyone who steals from emergency relief programs. Fain didn't just steal from the taxpayers' pockets. He stole from struggling business owners who were more deserving of that money. You know, owners that weren't reality TV stars running illegal Ponzi schemes. It's plausible that Fain would not have been able to raise more money and continue his Ponzi scheme without the pandemic. COVID or no COVID, Fain was on the verge of getting busted for his scams. The pandemic was only speeding up the inevitable, and his trucking business would soon be exposed for what it was, an unsuccessful venture that never made enough money to pay back its principal investors. COVID drove the final nails in Fain's coffin. It was here that he could have come clean confessed his sins, and hoped his reality TV status would be enough to get him off the hook. Instead, he chose to rob the federal government. However, Fane's scheme could have potentially gone on for a bit longer, but not much longer than a year. Fain was already backed up against the fence with debt, other fraud cases, and a serious lack of funds surrounded him in the metaphorical alley. There is also reason to speculate that Fain's sentence of 17 years would not be nearly as long if not for the fact that he used COVID relief money to buy diamonds and lease British luxury cars. Although Fain's scheme was unique in that it involved one of the strangest and most impactful events of the 21st century, the overall characteristics of his scheme are not that unique when compared to contemporary Ponzi schemers. A recent scheme conducted by the now infamous Ian Bick was featured in a documentary series on Hulu. The episode tells how Bick stole over $500,000 from investors who wanted a stake in the teenager's growing nightclub business. Compared to Fane's scheme, it's a junior Ponzi scheme. But Bick's scheme does show a similarity in motive. Bick, in stark contrast to Fane, has been very open to discussing his nightclub scheme. In one of the many interviews he has done, Bick admitted that, in my mind, I was the next young millionaire entrepreneur, so I started spending it as if I already had it. Making sure that your friends and fans know you're wealthy is a big part of some reality star's entertainment value. Soon after so many episodes, movies, or songs, it becomes a part of your identity. For Fane, being a part of the hip-hop culture, the reality TV industry, and the American capitalist system was plenty enough to push him to find creative ways to achieve status 
in our society. And more than anything else, the reality TV industry seems to force people to get creative more than most lines of work. For years, reality TV has been attacked with accusations of being fake, staged, scripted, and overproduced, including love and hip-hop. To give these accusations some merit, some reality shows have even won Best Script Awards and stars have admitted under oath that their shows were staged. With its inherent reliance on fakeness, reality TV seems to cause its stars to do whatever it takes to maintain their image. Whether that image is that of a young millionaire or a hip-hop star you want to flaunt, it can be. Here are the men that should stop doing crimes. Number 10. Cucumber Shotgun Gary Ruff, a Glasgow plumber, was not thinking of the severe consequences when he accepted a dare, as he claims, to burglarize bookies with a cucumber stuffed inside of a black sock. The incident occurred at Ladbrokes, a small sports betting hub in the UK. Prosecutors divulged that Ruff armed himself with a long cylindrical object covered in a black sock when he went to the counter for cash. Witnesses of the crime scene claimed the sock sheathed vegetable looked like a sawed-off shotgun. Ruff brandished the weapon at an employee who, although terrified, refused to hand over the cash. And the next thing you know, an off-duty police officer who happened to be in the shop knocked the would-be burglar to the ground with a single blow. Everyone present was stunned when a cucumber was revealed inside the sock and not a sawed-off shotgun. As Ruff was handcuffed, he tried to claim he was only joking and was acting on a dare. Finally comprehending the gravity of his actions, he remarked, it was a cucumber. Am I going to jail for this? Ruff later claims, I think it was quite stupid. I am not a robber. It was a laugh that went too far. Ruff received three years for his attempt to hold up the bookie with a sock-covered vegetable. He admitted in court that he was quite stupid for trying to pull it off. His attorney's take on the crazy cucumber scheme was, while he was aware that it was a vegetable in a sock, he is also aware that it may have appeared different to others. It's too bad he didn't think about this before he armed himself with a cucumber in a black sock. What would have happened if the robbery had worked? If the bookie had handed over all the cash? Number 9. Selfie Burglar Ashley Keist is the worst burglar ever. And it's safe to say that we agree. Keist and an accomplice burglarized a home and made quite the haul while the owners were away on vacation. Their loot, cash, jewelry, an Audi A4, a Rolex, and the item that helped them earn the title mentioned above, a SIM card. Keist puts the stolen SIM card in another phone and takes a selfie. Here's where the story gets crazy. He posted the image on WhatsApp, and unknowingly, Keist also sent the picture to the victim's work colleagues who became suspicious and contacted the police. The police arrived at Keith's home the next day and arrested him. They also found cash and the Rolex hidden behind a radiator. Keith also admitted being in breach of a suspended sentence and received two years and eight months for his idiotic crimes. His partner received 18 months. We can't help but wonder if law enforcement might agree with the headline given that Keith's selfie made this the easiest crime they'd ever solve. Number 8. Fired ATM Would-be thieves in Everett, Washington accidentally set fire to the ATM they were trying to break into. Then they attempted to extinguish the flames by peeing on the fire. Here's how this bungled burglary played out. They ripped open the wall underneath the ATM and took a blowtorch to the metal box that held the money. The cash caught fire, then they peed on the fire to salvage the operation. When they realized all their dreams were going up in smoke, they fled. Firefighters and police were called to the scene when fire alarms went off and extinguished the fire. Once the smoke cleared, there was $35,000 worth of damage to the ATM, including the cash. The suspects were easily identified by surveillance camera footage that caught the entire incident on tape. Perhaps Monster Energy Drink appreciated the free publicity from the footage. Number 7. Milton Hodges the details in this story sound like the subplot in a Quentin Tarantino movie. Milton Hodges, a homeless man, was on the run after being accused of an armed robbery at a Kangaroo Express store in Kissimmee, Florida. He looked to hide in a local Lowe's, claiming he was just browsing for mango and banana trees. Next thing you know, Hodges was holding scissors to an innocent clerk's neck. Thankfully, the clerk escaped, and Hodges was chased out of the store by customers and employees. Hodges then climbed a wall and landed hard on the other side. However, he stuck out like a sore thumb. He had just climbed the fence to Cypress Cove Nudist Resort. He pulled a knife from his pants, threatened a security guard, and stole a golf cart. Let's not forget that he was the only person wearing pants. Hodges didn't get very far. Sheriff's deputies easily spotted him as the only clothed individual in the resort. Number 6. I.O.U. Note 
A UK financial advisor for Halifax Bank finally was arrested for stealing over millions of pounds from the bank he worked for and 84 of his clients. How did he get caught? An auditor found a signed IOU for £7 million in the safe. Are we sure this isn't Lloyd Christmas from Dumb and Dumber? Graham Price got 12 years of jail time after a court learned the money had been used to bet on horse races, among other gambling debts. Price bought information from tipsters and shares in 13 horses. He had paid off mortgage enjoyed lavish vacations, bought luxury cars, and was quite unsuccessful in betting on the internet. Price achieved this by bilking the bank he worked at for four years. A short time considering the millions he amassed and subsequently lost. Many of his victims were elderly and faced not only devastating financial losses, but uncertain futures. Halifax insists they are not responsible for customers conned by Price when he acted in his private capacity as a financial advisor. Number five, wrong bar. Would-be robbers picked the wrong night to burglarize this bar. Wearing ski masks and waving machetes, two men took a Sydney, Australia bar by storm, yelling at customers to hit the floor as they made their way to the cash registers. As the thieves entered the club, they failed to notice 50 motorcycles parked outside. Inside, the Southern Cross Cruiser Club had just started a meeting. The bikers picked up anything that wasn't bolted to the floor and fought back against the would-be robbers in what might be the most failed robbery of all time. One of the masked men crashed through a glass door, jumped off a balcony, and ended up in the hospital. And the other wound up hogtied. Both of the men, whose names were never released publicly, were arrested and charged with attempted armed robbery. Seriously, how did they not notice all the bikes parked out front? Number four, Dr. Ears. Sometimes having a distinctive physical feature works against you. In the case of David Holyoke, his ears, which earned him the nickname Shrek, became a huge liability as he pursued a career in crime. Holyoke and his cohort shattered a glass security window, got behind the counter, and stole cash after wielding a sledgehammer and threatening staff. There were witnesses, and of course, the burglary was caught on CCTV. Police quickly ID'd Holyoke since witnesses cited his ears as the most distinctive feature about his face. Before Holyoke and his gang could be arrested, they struck again as an armored truck delivered money to a post office. As the security guard walked in with the cash, Holyoke and his crew, masked this time, pulled up in a car, jumped out, and followed the guard. Unbeknownst to Holyoke, and a sign of poor planning skills, a police surveillance car was following the armored van. The driver saw the men run inside and radioed the guard to warn him of an attack. They were successful in stealing the cash box and fled in a getaway car. Unfortunately, the escape vehicle plowed right into a tree. Several of the robbers escaped on foot. Holyoke and two other gang members hid in a garden and were apprehended. Holyoke was sentenced to three and a half years for robbery. One officer commented, this man only needs to look at himself in the mirror to realize crime is not for him. With ears like those, why wouldn't you wear a hat or a mask to hide them whenever you are committing a crime? Number three, Terence Cole. Britain's worst burglar, Terence Cole, attempted six robberies and bungled five of them, but was spared from spending the rest of his life in jail. The judge pointed out that during Cole's campaign, he was described as Liverpool's worst bank robber. He also said that if Cole had been good at robbing banks, he would have faced a life sentence. Cole ended up receiving 12 years for his shenanigans. For 11 days between November 23rd and December 3rd, Cole from Liverpool, England, went on a crime spree and tried to rob six banks and a bookie, failing every single time except one. When he was finally successful, he made off with only $500 and left the clerk crying hysterically. Cole's meticulous methods in his burglary attempts included brandishing a gray hand brush wrapped in tape. He partially covered the lower half of his face with a scarf to muffle his voice and wore gloves to avoid fingerprints. Despite his attempts to be taken seriously, one cashier thought there was something wrong with the intercom system when Cole demanded cash. He called over a colleague for help, but Cole was gone by the time he turned around. Another clerk, either very brave or very irritated, told Cole to get lost. What motivated Cole to to take up a life of crime at this point in his life. Cole had accrued gambling debt and saw no other way out. He admitted to being at a very low point in his life and that he was very sorry for his action. Number two, Sharpie disguise. When they were arrested for attempted burglary, who knows what these two were up to, wearing possibly the worst disguises ever. One thing's for sure, their mug shots made headlines and there was some hilarious commentary about their efforts to disguise themselves. In Carroll, Iowa, police received a call about two male suspects, Matthew Allen McNally and Joey Lee Miller, trying to break into an apartment. The caller said the alleged criminals were wearing hoodies, had painted faces, and appeared to be wearing holsters. When officers pulled over a car matching the suspect's vehicle and looked inside, they were surprised to see the suspect 
suspect's faces were not painted on, but drawn on with permanent marker. Their disguise attempts were described as one guy trying out for a Kiss tribute band and the other wanting to know what he'd look like with a beard. The duo was arrested at gunpoint because of the holster comment and charged with attempted second degree robbery. McNelly was also charged with driving while intoxicated. The next part rarely gets reported, probably because it pales in comparison to the marked up mugshot. A judge drops the charges against both men, saying there was insufficient evidence to support probable cause that the men committed the crime. There was no evidence that they had entered the building or even tried to. Nobody could prove that either man had a weapon and no one was ever injured. While they technically got away with it, their mug shots will live in infamy as punishment enough. Number one, Popeye. Anthony Ward, also known as Popeye, was apprehended shortly after police posted his mugshot on their Facebook page with no accompanying description. The image went viral and was shared 3,000 times. One look at his face and it's obvious why the police didn't add additional details about the suspect. They didn't need to. Popeye is what one might call the worst face tattoo ever. Seriously, why would you ever commit a crime with a face tattoo like that? Gervin Singh seemed to be living the high life posting images of his high-end jewelry and fancy cars to support his claim that he made millions on the foreign exchange market. He promised that other people could follow his advice to become wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. In reality, Singh, or Gervs, as he called himself on Instagram, was selling nothing more than a pipe dream that cost many investors money they couldn't afford to lose. All these promises are red flags even a new investor should recognize. According to an in-depth investigation by journalist Moby Nazar, Gervin used his social media accounts to sell the false hope of guaranteed financial windfalls for anyone who invested their money into his scheme. Although Singh apparently raked in about three million pounds, the evidence shows it was hey! scamming naive people out of their savings rather than finding a profitable investment strategy. To convince social media users that he was the real deal, he made impossible promises that even the most experienced money managers wouldn't touch. Specifically, Singh promised his investors that they'd never lose any money. While most people disregarded his call to action, this 20-year-old scammer reportedly convinced roughly 1,200 individuals to send their cash. A few made it through the experience, only losing a few hundred pounds. Others handed over as much as 88,000 pounds that they never saw again. Singh's ego-boosting posts portrayed a young man with an undeniable knack for making a buck. At one point, he claimed his savvy investing skills turned 200 pounds into a whopping 100,000 pounds. The huge return on such a small initial investment was clearly enticing to others who wanted a piece of the action. He took the grift further by suggesting that investors could expect to make 300 pounds per day if they followed his lead and trusted him with their cash. He deleted old social media accounts and started new ones before settling on the handle at Mr.Gerbs. Still, his content remained centered on the same false promises and fabricated evidence of his personal wealth. One of his most popular posts depicted him handing out money to random strangers as if he had so much that he didn't know what else to do with it all. Singh presented himself as a reputable trader in the foreign exchange change or forex market. In reality, watchdog organizations and regulators kept a close mm -hmm. eye on his claims and ultimately warned the public that he was not properly licensed to make the type of investments he peddled online. Forex trading is a broad term that can refer to any transaction that exchanges one international currency for another. While reputable investors can make a healthy yeah. profit, the global financial system is full of fraud. One attorney specializing in such scams said that her law firm has taken up thousands of cases in which which victims said they were conned out of their savings by a forex fraudster. It's bad enough that Singh conned so many people, but the fact that investors lost all their money on Christmas Eve added insult to injury. One of those individuals, identified only as Jonathan, shared a story that was similar to many others who fell for the investment scheme. He was 24 years old at the time and saving money to buy a home. Most of the people who found Singh through Instagram were also in their early 20s. Although Jonathan said he frequently scrolled through social media to find funny posts and memes, sometimes an investment influencer would catch his eye. After he spotted the viral video showing Singh handing money to folks on the street, he became intrigued with the idea of investing in the system. Jonathan sent Singh a message, and the reply indicated that a 500 pound initial deposit would be required to move forward. It was a no-brainer for Jonathan, who was clearly 
clearly impressed by the luxury cars and expensive tastes displayed on Singh's Instagram account. The first step involved joining a group message to learn more about the process. After being told he'd earn 100 pounds right off the bat, Jonathan decided to sink more of his 17,000 pound savings into the scheme. Days later, Singh said the initial investment had nearly doubled and was worth 30,000 pounds. Jonathan knew the inherent risks associated with trading and investing. Ironically, he said it was rare to lose an entire investment. After learning all of his profits had been wiped out in December 2020, he realized how wrong he was. He remembers the losses coming quickly as 27,000 pounds turned to 9,000 pounds on Christmas Eve. Jonathan watched helplessly as more and more of his money evaporated into thin air. He said he assumed that the millionaire investor was working within the confines of British regulators at the Financial Conduct Authority, but he was wrong. In fact, the agency issued a strongly worded advisory confirming that Singh was not affiliated with the F. CA and urging prospective investors to think twice before giving him any money. Making matters worse, Singh and others involved in the scheme went back on their earlier promise that Jonathan would be able to take his money out whenever he wished. While he was obviously distraught over the whole situation, he said that others lost substantially more, including some investors who were scammed out of their entire life savings and found out about it the day before Christmas. Singh's scheme attracted significant attention outside of the social media realm. Veteran journalists journalist Moby Nazar was among the most prominent sources of information and compiled all of his evidence to create a compelling documentary titled Scam City, Money, Mayhem, and Maseratis. After his marks lost millions, Singh appeared eager to put the whole ordeal behind him. In fact, he launched yet another scheme online to target young people interested in investing. As media reports noted, his Instagram profile was scrubbed of any references to his prior Forex trading rhetoric, and in its place was promotional material about a new business called Academy to Earn. This venture, he claimed, consisted of an internet-based educational program designed to share the fundamentals of online marketing and sales. While Singh might have pivoted away from his prior strategy, Azara wasn't prepared to let him get away scot-free. Instead, the investigator reporter hunted for clues and interviewed a long line of people who claimed they were swindled out of their savings by a smooth talking social media user. His four part documentary aired on BBC Two and received plenty of critical acclaim. However, it was just the latest in a series of scandals and controversies he'd attempted to expose by digging deep into the relevant facts. His impressive portfolio includes reports on topics including U.S. drone strikes in the Middle East, the life of LGBTQ individuals in Pakistan, and an award-winning expose about a police-related incident in the United Kingdom. Azar also completed a labor-intensive book containing various details from the life of the late singer-songwriter Prince. After interviewing fraud experts and the apparent victims of the investment scheme, Azar tried to get some information from the source, found out where Singh was living, though it didn't reflect the lavish life he'd been selling on Instagram. Instagram. Instead, the journalist found him living with his parents in London. They were all sharing an ordinary house. There were no signs of the wealth Singh allegedly amassed through his expert knowledge of the foreign exchange market. When Azar confronted him outside of the home, it became clear that Singh wasn't ready to go on the record. Instead of responding to the reporter's questions, the accused scammer hid in a nearby store. A few moments later, Singh made his escape hustled down the street with his girlfriend while Azar was hot on his tail. Then the tight-lipped scammer hopped in his car and drove off, leaving Azar with more questions than answers. As Singh received increased scrutiny from the media, he decided to publicly address the allegations against him. Unsurprisingly, he blamed others for the fact that his scheme lost money. Specifically, he pointed the finger at Infinox, a brokerage firm that put the entire plan in motion. For its part, a Bahamas-based branch of the company claimed it operated within the confines of the law and denied any wrongdoing. On the on the other hand, Singh insisted that he agreed to a deal with the firm to attract investors and claimed he didn't know at the time that the partnership was doomed to fail. Infinox UK has also distanced itself from Infinox Bahamas and said that the British-based branch had nothing to do with any agreement to market the investment scheme. Official documents suggest that Infinox Bahamas took the lead in determining where to invest the money. Still, its CEO asserted that Singh's actions were why those investments ultimately went south. A series of WhatsApp conversations also surface, revealing that victims were being told that their investments were making money. In reality, they'd been shedding profits since at least 2019. The individuals in charge of managing these accounts appeared eager to downplay any evidence that the investments were losing money. Eventually, the combined value of these assets dipped below £4 million. All the accounts were closed and the investors lost all their money.
The evidence suggests that Infinox Bahamas played a central role in developing and marketing this corrupt investment plan. Nevertheless, Azar's documentary series revealed details that emphasize Singh's involvement in defrauding investors. The bottom line is that there's clearly enough blame to go around even if no one involved wants to accept their share of the responsibility. Amid all of the finger pointing at play in this story, Singh hopes he'll convince critics that he's just one of the victims. He continues to tell the world that his only error was signing a contract in good faith that resulted in a series of ill-advised trades and ultimately cost investors millions. In his mind, he was just a young entrepreneur trying to make a name for himself when he fell victim to a business that offered him a misleading contract. He also shared his desire to sit down with regulators at the FCA to address the organization's depiction of him as an unauthorized financial services provider. For what it's worth, the FCA still included its warning about Singh on its official website, even as he tried to shift the blame to Infinox. When they asked about the contents of Azar's documentary, Singh opted to keep his mouth shut. So far, Singh has not been charged with a crime. Although it's unclear whether the legal system will ever hand down justice for the perpetrators and victims, there's no doubt that the underlying scam will attract significant attention for years to come. Thankfully, folks like Jonathan are willing to discuss their staggering financial losses. Meanwhile, Azar and other brave journalists continue digging up details and following the facts wherever they lead. Irving Fryer had an impressive and lengthy football career. He played for the University of Nebraska, where he was an All-American. Fryer was the first overall pick in the 1984 NFL Draft, becoming the second wide receiver ever to be taken first overall by the New England Patriots. Before Fryer, it had not happened since 1964. Statistically speaking, Fryer had his best seasons when he was well into his 30s. That's usually when receivers are winding down their career if they're even still playing at all. He played 17 seasons and retired at the age of 39, setting many records for longevity. He was the first player ever to score a touchdown in 17 consecutive seasons. He caught touchdown passes from 19 different quarterbacks. He was also the oldest player to ever score four touchdowns in a single game, which he accomplished when he was 34 years old. As good as he was on the field, Irving was also known for getting into legal issues off the field. In 1986, as a New England Patriot, he had to miss the AFC Championship game after cutting his hand during a domestic dispute with his wife, who was pregnant. He attempted to lie and cover up the incident, but the truth eventually came out. He returned to play in the Super Bowl that year, where he ended up scoring his team's only touchdown in a brutal loss. A few years later, in 1988, he was arrested on weapons charges. A New Jersey State Trooper found a loaded shotgun, handgun, and hunting knife in Fryer's car. Irving's problems likely stem from his turbulent childhood. His father was an alcoholic who would abuse Irving's mother. If Irving ever tried to intervene, he'd be caught in the crossfire. The young Irving joined the G-Town gang and frequently got into street fights. Irving was a big gambler, and many suspected him of betting on the games he played in. In a book titled Big Red Confidential, Inside Nebraska Football, the author, Armin Ketchien, alleges that Irving threw the 1984 Orange Bowl. He missed a crucial touchdown pass, and some people think it was intentional. Nothing was ever proven, but the rumors would follow him around for the rest of his career. When he joined the NFL, there were more allegations of Irving throwing games. The NFL took these allegations so seriously that they launched a full-on investigation and Irving had to take a lie detector test. He passed, but that didn't really get everyone off his case. Lie detectors aren't infallible, after all. William Usley, a former FBI agent who led the investigation for the NFL, said of Irving, I wouldn't doubt anything said about him. Not exactly a glowing character review. Irving also did admit to doing drugs the night before the 1984 Orange Bowl. Not something you would do if you were laser-focused on winning at all costs. Many NFL players quietly retire and are never really heard from again. But that wasn't Irving's style. After his notably long NFL career, Irving became a reverend. He had grown up going to church, and his childhood home was right next to a parish. His father was even a singer with a traveling gospel music group. His sisters, named Faith and Hope, were also singers in the church choir. Irving's name was originally supposed to be Hope, but his parents changed their minds when he ended up being a boy. The adult Irving strayed from the straight and narrow path his mom had laid out for him. In 1990, he hit rock bottom hard. He went to a Providence, Rhode Island club with his teammate Hartley Dykes. Around 1 a.m., Dykes got into an argument with some people at the bar about the Patriots. He ended up in a full-on brawl with them outside the club, getting beaten with a pair of crutches that one of them happened to have. 
Irving went to his car, got his gun, and hid it in his shoe, and then came back to help Dykes. Before he could do anything, somebody hit him with a baseball bat. When the cops showed up, Irving got arrested for carrying a gun without a Rhode Island permit. He spent the night in jail, but the charge was dropped soon after because he had a Massachusetts license. Irving would later say that he was arrested for saving his friend's life, which isn't necessarily true. However, Irving wasn't the one who started the fight. The worst part of the arrest for Irving was that nobody came to get him out of jail. Nobody he knew seemed to care. The cops also didn't really care. They came in and visited him to get an autograph, but took their sweet time finding someone to stitch up his bleeding head. Irving had to wait until the following day to get eight stitches. Irving was alone and depressed. He later wrote that during this time, not only did he consider retiring, but he considered ending it all. Then, one Sunday, four months later, he happened to visit a little church called Greater Love Tabernacle near Boston. Irving said that church hadn't really meant much to him before that visit. He didn't like the hypocrisy he saw from Christians growing up. People would act a certain way in church and a certain way at home. But for Irving, this little church in Roxbury was different. He went back the next week and bought the church a new organ. And that was just the beginning. Irving became a minister and got a PhD from the North Carolina College of Theology. His younger teammates called him Rev. He totally turned his reputation around and went from being someone the NFL had to investigate to one of the NFL's good guys. He donated a lot of money to youth programs and started visiting sick kids in the hospital. It was a complete 180. Irving later founded his own church in his hometown and kept trying to help out the younger generation by coaching high school football. His basic message for the kids was simple, don't do what I did. In 1996, the NFL gave Irving the Bart Starr Award. The Bart Starr Award is for players who demonstrate great character and leadership outside of football. It's a pretty big deal and has since been won by some big names like Eli Manning and Aaron Rodgers. But Irving's change of heart didn't last all that long, if he ever really had a change of heart at all. In 2009, he got his own mom to help him pull off a huge bank fraud scheme, but it wasn't a strict family affair. He also had some help from a few other shady characters. Oddly enough, it was most likely Irving's dentist who introduced him to the world of bank fraud. His dentist, Alfred Dennis, had carried out a similar scheme with his wife and defrauded banks of nearly a million dollars. He got three years in prison when his plan was uncovered. Dennis was also the one who introduced Irving to a man named William Barksdale. Before the fraud scheme went down, Barksdale had actually helped Irving pay off a tax lien on his New Jersey mansion. The mansion, while huge and beautiful, was a big financial problem for Irving. There was a 2006 federal tax lien on the mansion for $76,000. The property was foreclosed on in 2007, and Irving's mom had to buy it back from the bank in 2009. One of Irving's former teammates, Mario Henry, said that Irving was particularly attached to the mansion. He wanted to keep holding on to it at all costs, even though it was causing him so many issues. Irving was actually a spokesman for Mario's mortgage business for a while, but Mario decided that wasn't a good idea after Irving's bank fraud trial. It's not really a good idea to have the celebrity spokesperson for your financial company be involved in a serious financial fraud case. Irving had his mom, who was 68 years old at the time, visit five different banks. She closed on home equity loans at all of them. This isn't inherently illegal, but here's where the fraud part comes in. She used the same house as collateral for all of the loans, which is very illegal. She had to lie and tell all these banks that she was not using the house as collateral for any other loan. The two of them used one house valued at $140,000 to get five different loans, which added up to $700,000. The banks could have avoided the entire scheme had they done their due diligence. However, no protocols existed to combat this situation. It's not like banks regularly called each other and asked if a collateral property was being used multiple times. The technical term for this crime is second degree conspiracy and theft by deception. A theft by deception is slightly different than a run-of-the-mill theft, legally speaking. It's essentially a con. Theft by deception happens when someone obtains property that belongs to someone else using deceptive tactics rather than violence or breaking and entering. Another example of theft by deception would be selling a house but hiding all the problems it has from the buyers. It's punishable by up to 10 years in prison in the state of New Jersey, which was where they were at the time. Irving and his mom were both indicted on those charges. The prosecutors alleged that his mom knew what she was doing, but that Irving was ultimately the mastermind behind the whole thing. Irving and his lawyers have offered up a different version of events. They claim Barksdale was responsible for everything. He tricked Irving and his mom into defrauding the banks and they didn't know what they were doing. The court didn't go along with this and Irving ended up back in jail. 
On October 2nd, 2015, Irving and his mom were convicted of mortgage fraud. Irving got a five-year prison sentence, but it could have been a lot worse. His mom got off with probation and never saw jail time. John Hoffman, the attorney general who oversaw their case, said that he felt the crime was made even worse because Irving had the resources to succeed but chose crime instead. On December 7th, 2015, a judge delivered even more bad news for the two of them. Irving had to pay $615,000 worth of restitution to five different lending institutions that they had cheated in their scam. Irving lucked out and didn't serve most of his prison sentence, only doing eight months before being let out. Because he was a non-violent offender, he was granted his freedom so long as he was placed under New Jersey's supervision program. Click here to watch one of these next videos. And let us know in the comments which professional sport league you'd choose to play in if you were granted a wish to choose.